night, sweetheart. It's time for bed. Do I have to, Mama? Just listen to your mother. But who's checking you in? The wolf? No. The bear? No. My nanny! Yay! <laughs> now off we go. Faster, faster! You're a train, you're a train! Daisy Armstrong. Now straight to bed and no more nonsense. Oh, all right. Close your eyes. After your usual standards. What is this, Monsieur Paul? My friend! Oh, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? The 
This is my city. I live here. Give me a new food. I run Wagonwind, the greatest train company in the entire world. The central office is here at this hotel. Oh, got a song. This meal is on me. Please, charge my office. Oh, no, ah, please. Give me pleasure. You are my guest here. So tell me, what are you doing here? You're solving a crime, huh? Um, no, 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 no. That was lest we conceal it. It was a bad affair. She, an army officer, a missing check, a beautiful minion, but well, it did not end well. The man was guilty, that was certain. Maybe it was because I pressed him too hard to admit his guilt. It was unfortunate in the extreme, yet I believe I did nothing wrong. Of course you did nothing wrong. If you break the law, you must pay the price. <laughs> that is what you have told me. It is what I live by. Now tell me, you're staying here in the hotel? I was hoping, eh? I wanted to play tourist for a bit, but at the front desk of the telegram from Scotland, you are begging for me at once. So I've asked the concierge for a ticket tonight on your famous Orient Express. There will be no problem. And the best news is, I will be joining you for tonight to go to the sack business. So magnificent! <laughs> Pardon. Monsieur, but the concierge said to tell you that there are no more first class tickets for the express tonight, for it is also that. No, no. At all. It is my train, and it is never sold out at this time of year. It's ridiculous. It must be a party or a convention, perhaps. Well, you tell the concierge to find a berth for Monsieur Poir. He is my personal friend. But, Monsieur, compartment number seven is always available. It is held in reserve. Go tell him. Right away, Monsieur. Merci. It is not. Just now, you see this menu? Hmm? Throw it away! For tonight, you and I will sit on the train together just like old times, and we will dine like kings. The, the food on the train, it is uh, edible. <laughs> Monsieur Poirot, you stab me in the heart. I am writhing on the ground at your feet. It is not a mere train that will carry you to me. It is a legend. It runs like no other vehicle on the earth. The fittings are from Paris. The panels from Venice. The plates are from Rome. The towns, New York. The best food. The best beds. The best pillows. The best feathers inside of the pillows. There is poetry on wheels. If Lord Byron could not write it better himself, Monsieur. Yourself. In one hour, I will meet you on the platform of the Orient Express. Debenham. You'll be staying with Miss Austin here. I will do my very best to be sure I am not disturbing you. 
Oh, I'm sure we'll get along just fine. Hector! Here, sir, uh, I'm right here. Is the luggage on board? Yes, yeah, sir, it is. Can I check to see if any mail arrived overnight? And this came in apparently. Dang it! I know, it's awful. I mean, just look at it. Prepare to die? Sir, keep your voice down. You should call the police. It's not their business. But these are dangerous. This is the third one you've gotten in a week. It's good that you have a gun. Hey, could you keep your voice down? Excuse me, monsieur. Could you direct me to compartment number seven, please? Ah, uh, number seven, I believe there must be some mistake. That does what? Uh, I am due in London by the end of the week. Uh, my name is Hercule Poirot. Hercule Poirot? The detective? Hmm. Hey, what do you know? Hercule Poirot. I've heard of you. You're famous. Merci, monsieur. My name is Ratu. Samuel Ratu. Import and export. I may have some business for you. I'm afraid I'm on vacation, monsieur. <laughs> but when you hear the price, you'll change your mind, eh? Ha! Come up and tell me, Joe Ratty. I know where I'm going. Thank you. We'll discuss it inside. Ah! Monsieur Poirot! You beat me to the gate. Hello, You've met Michel. He is from Paris. He is the best conductor in the company. Monsieur, Monsieur, I believe there must be some mistake. Your friend says he's in compartment seven and it is taken. In fact, the entire first post is full. That's incredible. Yes, the entire world of extra travel tonight. You will put him in compartment number one, please. It is my personal compartment. I will find something in one of the other carriages. Wait, wait, wait. No, more than me. I'm not going to take your bed. I insist. It is done. Michel will make the arrangements. You're dead then. Now, tell me, have all the other passengers checked in? No, we're still waiting for me. Miss Hubbard and the Count and Countess have been dreaming. I hear that the Countess is one of the greatest beauties of Europe. She's Hungarian, I believe, a commoner, who then became a doctor. When she married the Count, she became royalty. I see her coming. <laughs> Countess Elena and Reni, welcome. I am Monsieur Bouffe. I'm delighted to see you. Your reputation precedes you, madam. Oh, may I introduce my friend, Monsieur Hugh Wagner? Monsieur Poirot, the famous detective. That's been wonderful. I have a bunch of papers, Monsieur. I admire you greatly. Le grand Kedves. Est assez cochac. Le grand Orvindek. You speak Hungarian beautifully. Not as well as you speak English. May I take you back? Uh, no, no, it is nothing at all. Will your husband, the Count, be joining? Ah, uh, alas, he did not join me just then. Um, but since I'm visiting my mother, it worked out quite nicely. He does not like her. <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur Poirot, I look forward to hearing of your wonderful adventures. I look forward to telling you about them. I believe you are in love. Is this that Orient Express I've been hearing about? It doesn't look that impressive, at least not from here. You, uh, Miss Hubbard? Miss Helen Caroline Peabody Wilson Van Pelt Hubbard, if you please, from the beautiful Garden State of Minnesota. My first husband, Mr. Peabody, was a good soul, but the poor man didn't have any talent for longevity. Well, I shouldn't say poor. He did very nicely for himself. Thank you very much. My second husband was a Mr. Wolfson, who I loved rather dearly, but he loved a lot of women. So I traded up and got a man pelt. Or I got in bed with the redhead from the Waldorf that did his nails. Then at last I found Mr. Hubbard, and I call him my little white knight for saving me from a life of watery cocktails and bridge games at the Minneapolis Country Club. Will Mr. Hubbard be joining? He will not be joining me. We traveled together once and he said he risked his blood pressure. <laughs> I don't know why. So, now I travel for the both of us. Do you like to travel? I travel every day. <laughs> well, you and I should exchange notes then. Compartment three, madam. Is that yours or mine? Yours, madam. Oh, I hope it's comfy. I've never gotten a complaint. I'm sure you haven't. <laughs> <laughs>
This is quite the character. They are all characters. If I was Balzac, I would write a novel about all of them. Just think. In three days' time, all of these people, these strangers, brought together eating and sleeping under a single roof. Then at the end, they all part ways, never to see each other again. Unless, unless, unless what? Something were to happen, something fatal occurs. Yes. Why would you say such a thing? Forgive me, it is my business. I, I sense a tension among these passengers of yours. One of them does not fit in, and it is right. No more business. Please. From now on, you must succumb to nothing but pleasure and prepare yourself to ride upon the pride and joy of the company wagons for the most memorable journey of your entire life. Mr. Poirot, slow up. Now, I'd like to discuss that proposition I mentioned. I'm afraid now is not a good time. Oh, sure it is. Please, sit down. It'll be quick, I promise. I'm afraid I'm Sit be... down. Bien. Proceed. Now, I want you to take on a job for me. You take on a few good cases. Well, you take this one, and I guarantee it. Why is that? Because I'm talking big money. That's it exactly. You see, I've been getting some threatening letters lately, and I want an extra pair of eyes to do some snooping around. And that's what you do. Am I right? Snooping? Well, of course, I can take care of myself. $5,000. How does that sound? None. All right, 10 for a few days' worth. I'm not for sale, monsieur. I've been 
very fortunate in my profession to where I take on only such cases that interest me. And frankly, we do not interest me. Well, you want me to grovel? Is that it? I want nothing, monsieur, except to leave. aren't you? That is correct. Well, you're awfully pretty. And from what I hear, you used to be a commoner like the rest of us. That is also correct. So does that mean you'll have a drink with me? I hear married. Monsieur, my husband is having business elsewhere. Now, please excuse hey, me. Hey, not so fast. Move out of the way. You don't have to get please all high mind. Stay out of my way a second, or I will scream. No, just, just wait a minute. You said that you were unattached at the moment, right? And we're on the train. So who's going to know what happens on some private room, on some two weeks? Stay away from me! Oh, Mr. Ratchet, uh, I've been looking for you. I uh, put your glass of wine next to your bed, and if you didn't need anything else, then I... Shut up! Okay, dude, shut up! <laughs> My friends! I hope that you are both settling in all right and enjoying yourselves. Yes? It uh, won't be long now until... <laughs> Would you tell that ridiculous woman in there to keep it down? It's time for bed. A ridiculous woman? I heard that. Monsieur, the lady wants to sing a little song. It's 12 o'clock at night. Now listen, you just mind your own business. Hey, this is my compartment. Get out. If I want to enjoy myself, I'm going to do it. So just pipe down, all right? You can sing. Just get out. What are you, thugs? Are you in the mafia? Michelle, I think she's dangerous. <laughs> oh, my God! It's a good Michelle! He's coming out! I'm just not to get to the Belgrade Station, Orient Express through Belgrade Station. 
emergency phone number, 8670 CZO code 3. Do you read me about Green? You read me express. Great to We have just lost Sophia. The snow is getting heavier by the minute. I'm getting concerned as we head into the mountains, so please prepare any emergency equipment in case of stoppage. Do you read me about Green? Hello, Bogre, do you read me? What's the matter? I got your nuts. Well, I'll tell you what the matter is. I'm... I'm frightened. We shouldn't be doing this. Now calm down. I can calm down. Um, we have to stop this. That's ridiculous. No, it isn't. See, that's the problem with you military men. You never show any real emotion. It's always stiff. A blip, no matter what's going on. <coughs> You're doing nothing wrong. You have to remember that. Well, I'm trying. I'm really... Really trying. Yes, I. I think so. There, there was this hill near my home in Scotland, and I sit there for hours, watching as the trains pass by in the valley below, knowing that they were off to exotic locales, and I wanted to climb aboard in the worst. But you didn't. No, I suppose that I somehow knew it would break my mother's heart. You are a very good man, you know. She was a very good woman. Do you know what the worst part about all this traveling we've been doing? We don't get any sort of privacy. It's honestly maddening. Well, I don't see any water at the moment. Do you? No, I... I suppose I don't. Oh, James. Be strong. I promise. I will. Hi, I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Of course you're interrupting, you moron. Are you blind? Oh, I'm so sorry. I can go get a snack or... Oh, my God. The train is stopping. What is it? What's happening? The snow. Look. We've had a snowdrift. Christ, that's all we need. Uh, shall I go take a look? What good will that uh, do? James! Um, honestly, uh, go ahead, Mr. McQueen. Um, we'll be waiting for you. I'll be back in a minute. Why did you send them off like that? I've been waiting for this. We are not moving. You are telling me. A snowdrift. We. We are 
stuck here until men from Belgrade come to dig us out. No, 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 no. No, I'm sorry, my friend. But I promise you will be completely comfortable for as long as it takes. Luke, have you tracked him down yet? Not yet, madam. Well, keep trying. Good night, my friend. Try to get some sleep tonight, because that'll make one of us. And hurry up about it. Believe me, I won't hear the word. 
Regards, you see the left side of his face is slightly red. I do. It has been slapped. How do you know? Because I slapped it. <laughs> I count eight stab wounds. That was my count also. Could you estimate the time of death for me? I would say between eight and ten hours ago, so between midnight and two o'clock. I mean the cold. The killer appeared wild. A frenzy of some sort. And do you see this? All these stab wounds. Five are strong. Three are mere scratches. And they're all from different directions. Do you see? I need a pencil. Yeah. Oh. Um, place the pencil inside each. Push it gently. Is this necessary? Perhaps a man change hands during the stabbing. Or there were two assailants. One right handed. One strong, one weak. It is not impossible. But another question presents itself. Why did Mr. Ratchet not fight back all the while he had this gun hiding under his pillow? Oh, la, la. A loss, may I see? How did you find it? He showed it to me yesterday, so I knew it was in here somewhere. It is an automatic, and I believe it's still loaded. <laughs> Excellent. One moment, I have a very good news. It's a glass of wine. It smells of almonds. He was clearly drunk, which is why he did not fight back. back. Wait, do you see this in his pocket? Oh, no. It is a watch. And the face is smashed. It is soft one fifty. Counter set between midnight and two o'clock, so there it is! One fifteen is the time of death. It is possible. What do you mean it's possible? What's wrong? I do not know what is wrong and what is right because I'm still investigating. Here is a pipe cleaner, and here is a match of a different shape, and another match of a different shape. I, there are too many clues in this room, it makes me suspicious. Another clue. And whose age is in Hamlet? That is the question. Uh, there is Miss Heather. I believe her first name is Helen. What about the princess? Her name is Natalia Dragomiro. And then there is Greta Olsen, the McQueen, James R. Knott, and Mary Devon Ham. And I am Constantine Fook, and something like this has never happened in my company. You're upset. I'm very upset. Everything will be all right. I hope so. I will smoke a cigarette. That is a good idea. Oh, just look at this ashtray. The people are lying. Do not touch it. It is a seal. It is a piece of paper. It has been burned. Possibly by the information it contains. Uh, what I need right now is a lady's rap box. Countess, keep it. Look, I quite admire the creature. Uh, you see, I asked her to help you with the body. She rolls up her sleeves without question. I ask her to get me a hat box. She uh, gets me a hat box. Suddenly, I desire to be young again. <laughs> what I need right now is my spirit. I use it to eat the wax from my mustache. And why do you need a spirit like that? Because this time, I am using science to catch the guilty party. Usually. For me, it is the psychology, the mind of the kid, but not with these clues. Why not? Because I do not trust them. The handkerchief. Did a woman drop it, or did a man drop it and say, I'll make this look like a man's crime, woman's crime? Uh, same with the pipe cleaner. I'll make this look like a man's crime. There's also the watch, the open window, the wine, the gun. There are too many clues in this room, and it makes me unhappy. Excuse me, monsieur, your hat box. Merci, madame. Monsieur Fossumfried? Countess, if I asked you to 
leave your husband and come with me to Monte Carlo, what would you say? I would say, give me five minutes, I need to pack. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> In the meantime, please, hold this. Now, this piece of paper uh, is a not a possible threat that has been burned by the information it contains. So I want both of you to pay very close attention, for the letters will appear, but only briefly, as the fire is still coming. So we must regard them all again. Now, we place it over the fire like so. Did you see? But what does that mean? There was a case in America three years ago. Four. A little girl was murdered. I do not remember. It was a case most horrible. Horrible. A little girl named Daisy Armstrong was kidnapped from her home in Long Island, New York. The ransom was set at $200,000, and it was paid. But Daisy, she was not returned to her parents. Three days later, they found a little girl, dead, murdered in the woods nearby her house. No! The police caught the man who did it, but he was tied to organized crime. Changed the evidence and let him off. If he would have been found by the public, he would have been hanged. Gave him the slip and disappeared. But what does that got to do with Ratchet? I think we can guess this, no? Of course. Mr. McQueen said that Ratchet was fleeing from something in America and that everything was fine until the letters started arriving. Then you, you think. Samuel Ratchet's real name is Bruno Cassetti. The man who murdered little Daisy, I'm sure. Oh, good God. Mr. Quadro, I found the letters. Bon. Merci. And so it begins. Monsieur Book, I need the passport and tickets of everyone on board. Then send to me uh, Miss Olsen and the princess together. Then Mr. McQueen, then Mrs. Hubbard. Now, vite, vite, for the child is cool. It's clear to me that someone on this train has committed this murder. I will find out who it is. I promise you. Mademoiselle, 
Just one more question. Are you aware of the man who was murdered last night? His name was Raja, and I prayed for his soul. <laughs> no, my dear. His name was Bruno Cassetti. The Countess told me. And what I pray is that his soul is damned and that he burns in hell for all eternity. Princess, he murdered a girl named Daisy Armstrong. Her grandmother was my dearest friend. You would know her as the actress, Linda Armstrong. She was very great. Not was, monsieur. She is very great. She is very much alive and remains the greatest actress of the American stage. And when her five-year-old granddaughter was murdered by this monster Cassetti, it took her years to recover. Indeed, she has not yet recovered. There were four who died. No, monsieur. Five. Five people died. Little Daisy and her mother, who was pregnant, died in childbirth. And the baby died too. And the little girl's father, Colonel Armstrong, could not live with what happened and ended his life. And the housemaid as well. Five human souls were extinguished. So please, forgive me, Greta, if I take the view that there is no forgiveness in a case such as this, and that Mr. Cassetti should have been flogged to death and his remains cut up and thrown onto a rubbish heap. <coughs> Greta, Greta, please. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. Monsieur McQueen, please sit down. Oh, of course. Will they be all right? I'm sure they will be fine. Do you remind me what your duties were? The secretary to your employer. Well, I wrote his letters and ran his errands and things. You knew him only as Reggie. How else would I know him? His real name was Bruno Cassetti. Holy God, are, are you sure of that? Then you know about the Armstrong case. You bet I do. My father was the district attorney for the state of New York. And he brought the case against them. Son of a gun! I'm sorry, but you have no idea what he did to that family. And they were so kind to me. Who was in the Armstrong household at the time of the kidnapping? Well, Mrs. Armstrong had a sister. She went to graduate school, but after the tragedy, she moved to Europe, and I think she got married. Her name was Helena. Mrs. Armstrong's mother would come to visit. She was an actress. Anyone else? There was a governess and a baby nurse, and of course he was an English. She was a French housemaid from Paris, and my, father, my father's office thought she might be implicated, and she was so distraught from the accusations that she uh, killed herself. But it turns out that she was innocent. My father was shattered. He never recovered. Could you tell me your whereabouts last night from 12 to 2? 12 to 2? Uh, I was on the observation deck when Colonel Arbuth found me. Did you see anyone you did not know? No, I saw Michelle, the conductor, and the other conductor in front of August. The step. other conductor? There was a second conductor. I guess so. I saw him. What was he wearing? A uniform. The same one that Michelle wears. And he looked like? I don't know. He had his hat pulled down. He was small bone, though. You know what I mean? A sort of feminine? Did you speak with him? I said hello, and he just kept going. Thank you, Mr. McQueen. You may go. Please ask Michelle to join me. Curtain. I'll see you later. I knew it! Mrs. Hubbard was telling the truth. I should have listened. Now, the only question is, where did he go? No, the only question now is whether such a man exists, or if he is an invention of Monsieur McCoy. But why would he lie? Why not? He's not a type. This? This is a crime of someone Italian or Hungarian. A man with blood in his veins. I have now looked at all of the passports. There is one that troubles me. It has a grease bottle, and it obscures the first letter of the Christian name. I think he's telling me. Who is it? Knock, knock. Excuse me, but I need to talk to you. Oh, sorry, madam, but if you could please wait until... No, I cannot time. wait my turn, because you owe me an apology. I do? You thought I was crazy! Pardon, madam, but I do not know to what you are referring. To what I'm referring is the man in my room last night. You didn't believe me? But guess what? I have a surprise for you. There was a man in my room, and I can prove it. He looked above me. Look. It says Orient Express. It sure as heck does. And it looks just like the one Michelle wears on his uniform. And you found it? This morning. Right as you please, right next to my big toe. I put these tootsies down on the floor when I woke up. Waited until now to tell us. I just woke up. It's called a vacation. And, and I heard about this wretched guy's murder, and I thought, you know what? Maybe this button guy did it. 
You see, it all adds up. He goes into Roger's room, kills him at 1.15, and comes up to my room a few minutes later, and, and I see him, and, well, I don't exactly see him. I sort of feel his presence, and, and do you realize that could have been strangled or shot or something? The man who name was not Roger, but it was Bruno Cassette. Does this mean anything to you? No. Have you heard of the Daisy Armstrong case? You mean that poor kid who got murdered? It was national news. The whole world's heard about it. So what? What were your whereabouts last night from 12 to 2? So now I'm a suspect. You know, you should read some detective stories and get some tips. 12 to 2. I already told you. I was in my room, and I see this man running out the door, and he scares the living with Jesus out of me. Could you sign your name on this piece of paper, please? I beg your pardon? Your signature, so I can see your handwriting. I always thought the French were screwed. He's from Belgium. Exactly. So it's, it's rough, but I'm looking for this Debenham. She is not here. Have you tried for real? Of course, I tried her everywhere. I've tried everywhere I can think of it, and she's gone. Have you tried the carriages and that guy's back in the train? Yes. I got Michelle to unlock and open all of them, and she can't be found anywhere. She cannot be found, monsieur. It is a very small train. I don't think you understand what I'm trying to say, monsieur. There was a murder on this train last night, and that has horrible implications. Does it not? Oh my god, it's her! Quickly, come with me! Where did that come from? I couldn't tell! What is going on? Miss Devonhart! She's, She's not in here! Try Ratchet's room! Miss Devonhart? Mary! Push! Push hard! Train goes over to. And then I screamed, and, and then I saw a man 
with the gun. And that's all I remember. It's so right. You're sure it was a man? I think so. I assume so. I, I'm not positive. He must have been hiding in this room, behind the door, waiting to escape. So you're telling me if I had got in there first, then I would have been shot? And then blam! No more show tunes in the shop. <laughs> and that would have been a terrible loss. <laughs> Who did you say the make of that was? It's hanging on the door handle in my compartment. If these compartments were bigger, I wouldn't have to hang it up like some drama kid. Rudolph Drummond for rent a living out of a whole dog. Can't you just shut up for one moment? Miss Devon, I'm a shot, and here you are talking about Oh my god, did that look? I've never seen one like that before. Uh uh. Do not touch it, we'll analyze it for fingerprints. In the meantime, could all of you please leave and touch nothing on your way out? When I'm finishing here, I will be in the dining car. I would like to speak with Miss Devon Hammond. Now listen, Eric. If she is able. Um, then, Miss Olsen. Princess again. Me? Countess, please escort Miss Devon from the room. Of course. You are strong enough? Yes. Um, thank you so much. Now, I see no reason to put Miss Devon out to do anything stressful at the moment, and I suggest you don't. Reserve that in mind. I suggest you solve all this quickly, Monsieur. I am not afraid of dying, but I would rather not speed up the process. <laughs> Sue this company on the grounds of sheer anxiety. Do not worry, ma'am. You're not the only one who's anxious. Zagreb, come in, please. We have an emergency. We are 20 miles away from the nearest town, and we cannot reach Belgrade. We need assistance. Zagreb, come in. Punctual. 
it, it is my profession. Sometimes I'm too imaginative. So I think you and the Colonel are very close. I, I suppose we rather hit it off. We mm -hmm. only met a few days ago. As for the Martin, I assume that you know that the man's real name was Bruno Cassetti. I heard. What did you know about the kidnapping? Not much, I'm afraid. I've never been to the States before. How long did you come to Istanbul? I lived with a family for about a year. I'm a governess. Could you tell me your whereabouts last night, from 12 to 2? I was with Miss Olsen in my room. We chatted until quite late. You see, um, she talks quite a lot when she's anxious, and so I may have dozed off for just a few, a few minutes. May I go? Yes, you may. Wait, Miss Devonham, would you mind signing your name on this piece of paper? All right. You're lucky I can sign with my left. I currently cannot with my right. Mercy, please, get some rest tonight. And on behalf of the company, I'll have some champagne straight to your room. Thank you so much. And if there's anything else I can do to help, please let me know. Goodbye. Goodbye. Huh. Could you imagine if she had died? My goodness, she's such a lovely young woman. She's more than a lovely woman, my friend. She's also a complete liar. Miss Devon. Yes. She swears she is not well acquainted with the country. Yet they are clearly intimate. All these words in Istanbul, and now she pretends they mean nothing. But she was shocked. The arm. She could have been killed. No wonder. Oh, la la! You do not suspect her of Cassetti's murder. It's not impossible. But it is impossible. A woman like that? She would not stab a man to death. She would. She would sue him in court. Oh, no, no, my friend. If you think that this crime was sudden and passionate, you are. This was a long-headed crime, and I would stake my career on it. Look at this. The sleeve of her blouse. So what? There's a powder ball at the entry point. Which means? That the gun was very close when it went off. So what? The man was two feet away. Pardon me, Jules. I finished the search. And, and, and? Nothing. There's no sign of any intruder anywhere. If you'd like, I can show you. No. Michelle, would you mind removing your tunic? Cut in the show, there are many cuttings. <laughs> Put your time on it. that there are no buttons missing. Moreover, the thread that holds each of them in is old. So nothing was sewn on recently. That is correct. Yes. May I ask? Miss Hubbard. She found this in the room this morning. It is not mine. I'm aware. This matches the ones in your jacket exactly. It does. Michelle, are there any other attendants on this train? There is a second class ticket taker I've known for years. And is he big or small? Quite large, I'm afraid. If you'd like, I can ask him to see. No. Are there any other passengers on this train besides the ones on this coach? There are not many. It is the off-season. There's a mother and a child on the Belgrade coach, but that is all. And could there be anyone else, say another conductor, who would be wearing the exact same uniform as you? No, nothing like that. It took me many years of service to get this uniform. However, we, oui. well, quite frankly, I don't know if I trust her word on this, but Miss Olsen claims she saw a second conductor on the train last night. Miss Olsen? We, oui, she told me this morning. She did not tell us this morning. She said he was wearing the exact same uniform as me, but when she spoke to him, he did not respond. In fact, go on. Well, the princess claims she saw him as well. Oh, la la. What? What is it? Just the type of clue I have been looking for. Michelle, come with me. Monsieur Book, stay right there. We'll be right back. But where are you going? You'll see in a moment. Excuse me, madam. I 
thought you wanted to question me. I do. Just stay right here. Well, that was exciting. As if we need any more excitement around here. Now, I want my passport back. What if there's another shooting and we have to make a run for it? I mean, could you imagine me in Yugoslavia <coughs> running around without a passport? They'd shoot me on sight and ask questions later. Who are you? Well, I'm Miss Helen Hubbard from the Minneapolis Gulf of Country. Brother! Miss Nomar Bajon. You've been very patient, Matt. And believe, I am grateful. If there is ever anything I can do to thank you, I'm at your service. You know, you remind me of one of my husbands. Which one? The next. No, no, please put it back. It is my token. You may not take it. He must have a reason. I have an excellent reason. Monsieur Poirot, really. You must permit me to take a look in your suitcase. But, but they are my private things and it has my undergarments. Monsieur Poirot. Anything that embarrasses you. Wait, I have an idea. Princess, please assist me. Miss Olsen, Michelle tells me you saw like, the second conductor last night. Is this true? Yeah. And did he look like He was small. Lego movies was at the square. I saw him as well. Oh. Well, it seems that everyone else on this train has seen the second conductor besides myself and Monsieur Fouquet. Excellent. Now, if you were still in uniform, we'd be able to find him immediately. But we must have hid his uniform in the luggage of one of the passengers. But, but why to me? There are other suitcases! It's right the other side! Please open Miss Olsen's suitcase and tell us what you see inside. Accusing you of anything, you've done nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. All the buttons in place, Monsieur Book. Now, there's one missing. And that is what I've been telling you. Are we surprised by this? But wait. There's something more. A pass key to all of the doors in the train. And that must be how the killer got in my room. Miss Olsen, when was the last time you saw your suitcase? It was yesterday, just after we boarded. Well, you could have hidden it in your suitcase. This I morning. don't know. I have never seen it before. Monsieur Poirot, I must insist that you stop bullying poor Miss Olsen in this manner. She is simply not up to it like the rest of us. Forgive me. Please escort her to her room. Bring Mrs. Hubbard with you. I'd like to speak with the Countess alone for a moment, if you do not mind. Of course we mind. Every time things get juicy around here, you just throw us out again. Oh, please stop gossip, Marie. Me? Your mouth is open so wide I can count your teeth. What a pleasure to learn you know how to count. Marie? <laughs> well, if I'm a bird brain, you're a communist. I am not a communist. I am an exile. From your husband? Why, that couldn't wait to get rid of you. And who's the one with all the divorce? My husband's word of faithful! And this surprises you. Well, ladies! Ladies! We're all a little walked up at the moment. Please, this way. I see that your first name is Elena. That is true. I am a suspect. I just ask questions. That is my job. I thought we were friends. That is my greatest wish. But indulge me. Now, on your passport, there is a grey spot. And it obscures the first letter of your name. A letter such as H. Now, if you put an H at the beginning of your name, it becomes Helen used by Shakespeare in a Midsummer Night's Dream. That is true. A name an actress would choose for her daughter. I suppose so. 
herself and actors such as Linda Aga, the grandmother of Little Daisy Armstrong. If you say so. The name Arden in itself is a stage name. It is also the maiden name of Shakespeare's mother and the name of a forest in his play entitled As, as You Like It. We know your Shakespeare well for a hundred years. I have studied Shakespeare since I was a child. I know, and I believe your mother, Linda Arden, taught it to you. This, of course, would make you the aunt of Little Daisy Armstrong. The aunt who went to graduate school, got a degree in medicine, then ran off to Europe and got married. I, I do not know this for me. But I would imagine she's the star with the loss of her niece and her sister. Gunters, there is no use hiding it. As soon as this train gets on your way and we arrive to the next station, I will simply ask for a telegram of Daisy's aunt and this will all be over. <laughs> Samuel Rexford, also known as Bruno Cassetti. You're kidding? No. I don't believe it. You know who did it? I believe I do. But first, I must interrogate the last of your fellow passengers who has not yet answered any of my questions. Colonel Arvin, Eh? James. Do you have a problem answering my questions, monsieur? No, of course not. Excellent. Now, during the course of your service to your country, do you know a man by the name of Charles Armstrong? No. Have you heard of him? Yes, we have served in the same theater of action together, but we never met. Have you heard of the Daisy Armstrong case? Of course. She was murdered by some brute who was out for the money. Are you aware that Daisy's father was Colonel Armstrong? No, I wasn't. And that he took his own life after the tragedy? God, I'm sorry to hear it. Back at 
you go tell him Istanbul, I overheard you talking with Miss Devon. Huh? You said to her that you wished she was out of all of these. What did that mean? I have no idea. Then she said to you that we could not be seen together until it was all over with. Could you tell me what that means? I can't imagine. Are you aware that you were obstructing justice? I am aware of no such thing. Then you, mademoiselle, could you tell us what you meant? I told you already I wanted to get the trip behind me. I think you are lying. Now listen here. Stand down, the colonel. I'm still talking. No. You wish she was out of what? You wanted to get what all behind her? I'm married. All right, I'm in the process of getting a divorce, which I deserve because my wife is seeing another man. But I'll lose my case in court if it's not that I'm seeing another woman social. When the divorce is behind us, we can stop hiding and move on, which is why we've been trying to keep things private, not thanks to you. I'm afraid you've been doing a very poor job of eating. Well, some of us have emotions, put all. I'm sure you'd sacrifice your own mother if it lets one of your damn solutions, and I'm sure you have no idea what the hell you're doing. You know exactly what I'm doing, Colonel. I'm investigating the murder of Bruno Cassetti. Well, he deserved to die! And you know who he is! Well, yes, they, t they told me. But you did not know before they told you? You were not friends with this man. You did not save lives together with the Indian Army of the Northern Frontier. You did not swear fidelity and friendship with this man at the time of the trial by fire today. And now you do not give him the respect he deserves after all of the tragedy he had been through, before he took his own life. Shut up, you got me, Nini! What did you do? What did you do? And why did you do just that? You've all been telling me lie after lie, but make no mistake, I know exactly who killed Bruno Cassetti, and I know exactly how it was done. Who are listening? The facts of the case could not be more simple. At 5 o'clock last evening, this train left Istanbul on its way to Calais with several stops in between. Then, at 12.30 last night, this train ran into a snowflake, causing it to come to a complete Stop. Then at 10 o'clock this morning, Mr. Cassetti's body was found dead in his compartment with eight stab wounds to his chest. These are the facts, said to have been. Now, these facts permit two possible solutions to the case. Under the first solution, a man boarded the train at Sofia, bringing with him a wagon lit uniform she later took off. Then, using a pass key, entered Mr. Cassetti's compartment and stabbed the man in the chest eight times, then left through Mrs. Hubbard's compartment. That's what I've been telling you. You're here? Well done, my friend. You've solved the case. Oh, I would not get too excited. You have not finished yet, have you, Monsieur? No, I have not, Princess. Two events made this first solution impossible. The first event was the snow which caused the train to stop. This now meant that the killer had a very big problem. Where could he go? He could not simply get off at the next station because there was no next station. So unless the killer could fly, he must be among us. He must be one of you. You said there were two unexpected events. We just can't wait to hear the second. The second event discovery of a letter that read, remember little Daisy, I'm sure. This meant that the killer was not some random enemy of Cassetti, but someone who came to avenge the death of a five-year-old child. I'm being fair about this, Mr. Devon, do you think? Um, I suppose so. The first clue leading to this event happened within an hour of my arrival to Istanbul when I discovered that there was no more first-class tickets left on the Orient Express. A dumb! It is my train, and it is never sold out at this time of year. That's ridiculous. And it was ridiculous. Why was this train so suddenly full? But thanks to Monsieur Hooper, I had a berth on the train. And soon on the platform, I met an astonishing company of actors. Monsieur 
Studio 4 I look forward to hearing of your wonderful adventures. Princess Dragamil, how lovely to see you. I have agreed to pay her way if she will assist me as I travel to Paris. I am not ready, except to go to my dear lives in heaven. Hungarian, Russian, Swedish, French, what were all of these people doing on the same train at the same time? Something was in this. It was like looking at a painting by Barbara Picasso. Over there is an eye, under an ear, behind a nose. Nothing was normal. Consider the moment in the corridor last night. Help! Help! Somebody come quickly! Help! Mrs. Hubbard, what? What is it? There was a man in my room. He just ran off. I'm sure of it. Which way did he go? That way. Just a second. But, madam, that is where I am coming from. I saw no one. What did he look like? How should I know? Then came the murder itself. A businessman in a locked room in a torrent of almost unspeakable violence. He did not have known it at all! Oh, do you see his chest? It is horrible. I cannot believe it. Then came time for me and the Countess to investigate the body. We did not count one, not two, but eight stab wounds to the man's chest. Perhaps a man changed hands when this happened? Or there were two sailors, one right handed and one left handed. One strong, one weak. After this, I was offered a feast of clues the open window, the wine, the gun, until one clue of real importance was at last discovered the broken watch. This starts at 1.15. Ha <laughs> Finally, something important, yes? And the Countess said between midnight and 2 o'clock. So there it is. 1.15 is the time of death. But for me, the importance of the watch was not the time it told, but the place it was found. In Mr. Cassetti's pajama pocket. An unlikely place to keep your watch, don't you think? You keep your watch in your pajama pocket. Do you? Or you? Of course you cannot, because it would be uncomfortable. This led me to conclude that the watch was deliberately placed there to make me think that the time of death was 1.15, when no one on this train has an alibi. But Mr. Cassetti, in fact, did not die until after 2 o'clock, when absolutely no one on this train has an alibi. You know, I really don't think we need to be subjected to a performance Sit like down, this Mrs. Hubbard. The second clue of real importance was discovered near the dead body. The handkerchief with the letter H in the fabric. And I now refer to its rightful owner, Princess Natalia Dredner. But my name begins with an N, monsieur. Except that in Russian, in the Cyrillic alphabet, the letter M is written like the letter H in English. Thank you. I must have dropped it. Then came the most puzzling occurrence of the entire case. <coughs> As some of you will recall, I was speaking with the colonel and Mrs. Hubbard when we heard a gunshot and a scream. <coughs> but this was no ordinary gunshot and scream. This was a fabrication so fantastic that even for a moment I was confused. Oh my God, it's her! What happened? Betty! Within moments, seeing Stebbenham on the floor, I knew it was all a sham, a performance. How could a gunman two feet away merely graze the victim? And why would I find a powder gun at the entry point of the blouse? Because Miss Stebbenham fired the bullet herself, then dropped the gun and fell to the floor. Nonsense! I have to be crazy! Exactly. Crazy? course of action that meant everything to you. Four people on this train are friends or family of this little daisy watch. Is this not incredible? My father brought the case against that son of a gun. Davy's grandfather is my dearest friend. Well, he deserved to die. I would imagine she still suffered the loss of her niece. And if there were four, could there not be six? I would not assume that Miss Stebbenham was Daisy's governess at the time of the kidnapping. I lived with a family for about a year. I'm a governess. Miss Olsen, she is a baby nurse. Could we not assume 
she was Daisy's nurse. I remember, Eddie. I broke in Africa with little babies. As for me, Shell, it struck me from the beginning that the crime of this cannot happen without someone from the inside. Someone saying they can duck, they can come and go as he pleases. Then I remember that the maid Suzanne, that killed herself, was from Paris, like Michelle. And I wonder if it has not been Michelle's doctor who went to work in America. It leaves one more of your fellow passengers. It leaves a Mrs. Hubbard, who has certainly turned in the finest performance of the evening. It is clear that she is an actress by profession. The grandmother of little Daisy Armstrong, the great Linda Arden. Come on in here, oh, come on in here, Alexander's a ragtime band. Mrs. Hubbard, I salute you, and I assume that you planned the whole scheme from the beginning. Is this, is this true? I always wanted to be a director. So the crime was committed. There were eight stabbed with a call. Five strong, three weak, some left of it, some right of it. And there were eight killers. You planned it together. You killed together. And in the name of justice, you played God together. For that little girl. For my daughter. For Charles. For Daisy. For little Daisy. For my father. For my darling Daisy. For my grandchild. Now, my friends, what would I do? Soon the Yugoslavian police will arrive, and I will have to tell them the truth. You mean the truth, of course, about the second conductor. Anything else would be a complete injustice. On the contrary, it is the only justice. You commit a murder, you must pay the price. But it was Cassetti who murdered the little girl. Which gave you the right to kill him? Of course it did. He killed five people for some ransom money. He'd done it before and he'd do it again. Now it's time for you to turn around, walk away, and leave us alone. No, it is not. It is not a time for you. I have never in my life turned my back on the law. You understand? If we do not obey the law, we become barbarians. The year is 1954, Europe is changing, and there will be chaos. There will be nothing left of us, and we will have to start over again. I will not support this. I cannot support this. But he was a monster, Monsieur Perot. You know he was. I will not. I won't. May a humble actress speak her piece. Please do, my dear. Monsieur Perot. We are in your hands, and we acknowledge that. But would you have really preferred it if Bruca said he had gotten away scot-free? Is that the kind of justice you are after? Look at it this way. You have a complete solution staring you in the face. You have the uniform, you have the button, and you have the three reliable witnesses who saw a man in the corridor. And surely you're not accusing all of us. Because if you did that, there would be months of trials. Lives would be damaged even more than they already have been. A great many people would be forced to relive the most terrible moment of their life. So terrible, no human should have to go through. Is that what you want? Look at your heart and tell us, is that what you want? You trouble me greatly. That is the solution that you should offer the police. The Lord's performance. May you 
go with God in the hope that he gives you all that you need to go on with your lives. Oh, God. since that the passengers had gone their separate ways. This also went to Africa for the first time in fact. It did help save many children's lives. Miss Debenham and the Colonel got married in a quiet ceremony in St. James Square. Monsieur McQueen returned to his business, Michel to his trains, and the princess left us for the great field. The Countess, alas, Return to her husband. Monsieur Bouc and I are still friends. And Mrs. Hubbard. The great Linda Arden, I have learned since that she has returned to the stage in a musical entitled No 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 No, where I've heard she brings the audience to their feet. Meanwhile, I beg you to believe me. And I hope that all of them prosper to the very end of their days. But at night, when all is darkness, I ask myself time and time again, was this justice? Did I do the right thing? And it is on many such nights that I do not close my eyes until morning. 